Kia ora koutou. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shaina Vaught. I'm the Deputy Leader of TOP. And tonight we have our leader, economist Jeff Simmons. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Kia ora, thanks, Shai. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's windy here in Wellington. What a surprise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Just living up to the reputation. Absolutely. Everything else is great. So everybody, thank you for joining us this evening. In case you missed it, TOP released our climate change policy yesterday outside Parliament. At least I think it was yesterday because these days are just... Yeah, one day just blends into the happening. other, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're living in a very different time warp, I think, at the moment. So everything just becomes very blurry. You lose all sense of time. So yes, I think it was yesterday that we launched our policy. Correct. Um, because look, obviously, even though we have been dealing with COVID as our huge crisis that has overwhelmed all of us each and every day, our climate crisis has not magically disappeared in that time. And it is still just as big and just as an important an issue as it was when people were striking in September last year, when people were striking every five years and 10 years before this. And it has been a growing issue since the science has been talking about this longer than I've been alive. So TOP has an issue, uh, is an issue. TOP has an issue with the fact that no one's doing anything about this. Uh, first of all, TOP released our policies today. But Jeff, before we jump, jump into that, I would just love you to kind of set the scene because what I hear a lot is when we chat about climate change, people go, oh, it's great. We got that, you know, zero carbon bill and cool, we're doing stuff. But <laughs> I worry that that gives people a false sense of security as to what that bill really was. So maybe if I throw it over to you to kind of explain really where we are at. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I do think the zero carbon act's given people a, a, a bit of a false perspective. We're not actually doing anything really yet. We just have, you know, the Zero Carbon Act was not not just because it is it is a, a great it was a great step forward, uh, but it really is just a plan to make a plan. Um, so we will start to see the Climate Commission roll out uh, proposals and plans for how to get us to our our um, twenty fifty target. But at the moment, we are not on track to meet that target. Uh, in fact, we're not on track to meet even our 2030 target, which is which is rapidly coming down the pipeline towards us. I mean, just to, so that people get a sense of of where we're at, New Zealand's emissions, as you say, you know, we we've been talking about this for for 30 years. Um, we signed the Kyoto Protocol back in 1997. Emissions have continued to rise since then. Um, they peaked around about 2005, then went down a bit and then went back up a bit. And, and they just sort of bobbled along since then. And we haven't even really started to, to get them down yet at all. Um, the only way New Zealand has met its targets up until now. So we had the Kyoto Protocol up to 2012 and the second phase of Kyoto, which went to, to 2020. The only way we've meet, met those targets thus far is by planting pine trees. And um, now we're starting to harvest all those pine trees. And actually that makes our job a whole lot harder going forward because our emissions are still really high and we're supposed to be getting them down and down and down. So uh, we've we've kicked the can down the road basically for, for 20 years and now our job is really tough. So, you know, we've got to crack on. And we do. And so let's just jump straight into TOP's plan to deal with this. Yeah, so if I was to summarise TOP's plan, it would be to listen to the experts. And that may sound pretty simple, but actually we know that, um, well, we know that National Act and New Zealand First uh, you know, aren't even really even pretending to care about climate change. And the parties that 
that do pretend to care labor in the greens are not actually listening to the experts. Um, so there's been a couple of big findings in the past couple of years. One was the first report that this Climate Commission put out was talking about how we needed to, um, both Labour and the Greens have talked about having 100% renewables electricity by 2035. And the Climate Commission said, well, actually, that's not the place to focus on because we're at about 85% renewable. We'll probably get to 90, 95% renewable without too much effort. But then the last 5% is going to be really, really expensive. And it's much better for us to, to focus on things like reducing transport emissions and reducing process heat. So process heat is things like the, you know, Fonterra using coal to burn, to, to boil milk powder, um, milk down into milk powder. So they said, focus on that stuff. And what Labour and the Greens have done is said, right, we'll have a target of 100% renewable by 2030 then. <laughs> So just completely ignore the experts that yeah. they put in place to advise Absolutely. them on what to do about this crisis. Okay, great. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. And, and, you know, I mean, if we're going to actually deal to climate change, we need to be really careful where we put our resource. So, for example, um, you know, Labor's talking about pumped hydro down in Onslow and the Greens are talking about uh, solar and both of those things long term may well be part of the solution. But we know that that's not the stuff that we should be focusing on to start with. Then that's not the low hanging fruit. And so what the experts are telling us to focus on is energy efficiency. Uh, and that's things like insulating our homes, getting energy efficient, uh, appliances, light bulbs, machinery in our in our factories, all that sort of stuff. There is money that we are all wasting in here in New Zealand simply because we're not being efficient with our energy. It can save money, it can reduce carbon emissions, and it can improve our health all at the same time. So there's this massive win-win-wins here that we're just not picking up. And And sadly, the only reason I can think of it is because it's not politically sexy, you know, giving out solar panels just sounds sexier. Um, so that And that people absolutely... like to see tangible things, right? Exactly. So, yeah. you know, a solar panel, that is something tangible that someone can say, yes, solar panels equals good. And I'm it's easy to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas energy efficiency can sound like this boring, vague kind of concept doesn't make you know it doesn't really appeal to people people don't get excited when you say energy efficiency that's right that's right even though but that's it, what the experts are saying we need to be focusing on yes absolutely uh and the other thing they're saying to 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 focus on is is um process heat so like i said um there that's all about things like fonterra making milk powder and what we need to do there is is get the carbon price up to about 60 or 70 dollars a ton that will really get those manufacturers moving to much cleaner energy sources to, to make milk powder out of. Um, and, and on yeah, that, Jeff, I think it's yeah. really important for context. So we need to get it up to $60 at least, right? But I Absolutely. think for context, what's it at at the moment, 25? 30, uh, it's, it's around about 30, 30 so, so it needs to okay. double. The, 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 the and, and compare that to, to what they're doing in Europe already. Yeah, so Europe, uh, the, the emissions price in, in Europe is, I mean, it moves around, right? But it has definitely been up to around $50 a tonne uh, already. And so we need to be getting up to, to those levels at least going forward. But the big barrier to that, and we'll come back to this, the big barrier to having a higher carbon price in New Zealand is pine trees. Because the cheapest way to offset our emissions right now, the, ch the cheapest way to reduce our emissions is not to actually reduce the use of fossil fuels, which is, again, what all the experts have been telling us to do. Instead, the cheapest way under the emissions trading scheme is to plant pine trees. And so we are looking at 
thousands and thousands of hectares of productive farmland being planted in pine. And don't get me wrong, like I, I'm not anti commercial pine. If it stands on its own two feet, if it makes sense to farm pine, that is totally, totally cool. But the fact that we're subsidizing it through firstly the, the Billion Trees program and now through the emissions trading scheme is nuts because that is just keeping the carbon price too low. And when you look at the projections of what New Zealand's likely to do over the next 10 years, we're still not going to reduce our emissions. We're just going to plant pine trees to keep offsetting them. And that is not progress. I don't think that's progress. So well, it's what not the, changing behavior at all. No, no, absolutely not. And so what it's the just saying, okay, you can be naughty, just plant some trees and we'll all feel a bit better about ourselves. <laughs> it it actually that's it does it, it is a bit like that. It reminds me of that kind of, you know, back in the Middle Ages, the Catholics the Catholics could uh, if you sinned, you could buy off the Catholic Church a splinter from Jesus's cross or something and that would that would um, be enough to uh, you know forgive you for having an affair or <laughs> or whatever you know it's, it's kind of uh, crazy it actually um, is a good analogy then <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we, we 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 can't forgive this this stuff you know carbon is going to stay in the atmosphere forever and um, pine trees, you know, they they're they're risky. They can they can burn. They are susceptible to disease. And most of all, after thirty years, they get harvested. Um, so we we absolutely shouldn't be using them as an offset to a permanent carbon emission. You know, it's a very risky thing to do. And so what the experts are saying again, this is the parliamentary commissioner for the environment. They are saying, let's use offsets for agriculture. So there's not a lot we can do to reduce our agricultural emissions. There's there's a bunch of stuff we can do, but but we, we, we're not going to be able to get agricultural emissions to zero anytime soon. So let's use trees as an offset there and work really, really hard to get our emissions down to, to zero um, when it comes to fossil fuels, because that has to be the focus. But, you know, um, methane is a very is a is a temporary gas. The priority has to be getting fossil fuel emissions down because they stay in the atmosphere forever. Another area I wanted to ask you about, Jeff is um and, and just to delve into a bit deeper oh by the way everyone if you have questions sorry if i forgot to say this earlier if you have questions feed type them in and the team will feed them through to us um so jeff maybe if you could just explain a little bit more about the free credits that are being given away at the moment yeah because i don't so think a lot of people know or understand that that part that goes on no, true. I, I mean, well, most people know agriculture basically get free credits at the moment, right? Um, but the government is is slowly bringing them into uh, the emission, well, allowing them to have their own emissions trading scheme. But even then, they'll have 95% of their credits for free. Um, but that free credit scheme also applies to our large energy intensive exporters. So the likes of New Zealand Steel, um, the an aluminium smelter, the uh, you know Fonterra to some degree with with like I said they're using a lot of coal to to boil milk down to milk powder. So these large exporters get a whole bunch of free credits um, so that they can continue to compete on the international market. And you know um, and uh, that does does make sense short term in terms of um, making sure that they can compete. But in the meantime, uh, we have to be getting our emissions down. And longer term, we are effectively subsidizing those, those um, businesses to keep operating. So that's a big issue for New Zealand. We have to reduce the amount of free credits that we're giving to those businesses 
At the moment, the government is planning to phase them out, but that means they'll still be getting free credits in 2100. Now that's, <laughs> that's not gonna get us to zero carbon 2050. So, um, so we need to be phasing that stuff out a lot quicker. That's crazy. Even just, you know, hearing 2100 is yeah. the year that we will be still dealing with this. Hopefully, yeah. whoever knows what that future will look like because the most depressed, I don't know, am I allowed to be depressing on a Friday night? I don't know if I should be. Sure, people, people can grab a beer <laughs> if they need to nurse themselves. The most depressing article I read recently was that just around looking at, and an, uh, an analysis of countries' policies and commitments to reducing their emissions. Yeah. And even if all countries implemented those policies, we would still be over that three degrees of warming. Yeah, I mean, so I think... that was slightly depressing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think we have to be realistic, you know. Um, a lot of the sort of rhetoric we get from the likes of the Green Party, 1.5 to stay alive, we've only got 10 years to fix this problem. I mean, it's good to have urgency, but my concern with that sort of approach is that people are going to start to despair and give up when we move past 1.5 degrees, because I, I honestly don't have a lot of hope that the world will get its act together by then. That doesn't mean I don't think we should reduce emissions. Absolutely, I think New Zealand should aim to lead the world on this sort of stuff. But when we don't, when the world sort of you know, doesn't hit those targets, there's no need to give up. You know, we we want to keep climate change as limited as possible. There is no magical temperature above which civilization suddenly disappears or, or ceases to function. The hotter things get, the more difficult they become for sure but it doesn't mean that we should give up at any point. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. At the moment on current projections, we're probably headed for, for, for three degrees. And so at the same time as, as reducing emissions, we also need to be preparing for a warmer world. Um, I, my personal belief is that humans will, they will uh, eventually sort it out and, action will really start happening that'll be when we start to see the real real disruption from climate change so i don't think we'll we'll meet the 1.5 degree target probably not even two degrees but i think once humans see that we're the, the kind of impacts that climate change is going to bring then i think people will start to act pretty quickly I just wonder if there's a sense, you know, perhaps it's because of this COVID world that we've been living in, that it's certainly taken a back seat in conversations, you know, things that would just be front and centre of the news for days and perhaps weeks, the fires that we're seeing on the, um, I was thinking west, west, west coast of America at the moment. And yeah, these are the types of stories that we would just be so focused on as examples of the impacts of climate change happening yeah. right now. I wonder if there's a little bit of a sense kind of related to what we were saying at the start of complacency around the fact we've got the Zero Carbon Act. So it looks like and feels like we have a government, especially because we've had a Green Party as part of the government arrangements over the past three years that people maybe get a sense of, OK, it's fine. You know, they're going to be doing the right things and we're going to have action there when we're not and there haven't been policies put in place to reduce emissions just offset with this yeah. whole pine planting ETS version that they've been continuing with. And yeah. as you said, Jeff, if they don't change it, that's going to be the same old, same old for another five, 10 years at least. Yeah. And and the big worry for me, Shai, is around this sort of post-COVID recovery. I mean, the government's big focus has been shovel-ready infrastructure. That doesn't mean it's very good infrastructure, uh, doesn't mean it's got a good business case or that it's going to help us get to a low carbon economy. So we need to, everyone needs to be looking at all of these infrastructure projects that go forward and saying, is this going to help us get to a low carbon economy in 2050? And we, we need to be, this, this is 
the big issue that we should be talking about for the next five years, because this the, the next government is going to be spending billions of dollars in infrastructure, and this will determine whether or not we meet our 2050 targets. So people have to be really watching and uh, engaging with all of these infrastructure projects and not letting the government get away with anything that is that that could ultimately lead to increased emissions. Okay, should we jump into some questions, Jeff? Yeah, please. Okay, so there's a question here from Thomas. Do you think river water is more important than the ocean? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it's, uh, it depends on where in the country you are, Thomas, I would say. Uh, different people would have different perspectives on that. If you lived in inland, you probably care more about the river than the ocean. Um, I mean, I think the, you know, if, if you're talking about pollution, then our certainly our rivers and lakes are more susceptible to pollution because most of our pollution comes from the land. And so, um, and, you know, um, when when that pollution ends up in, in the water, uh, our rivers and lakes are initially most affected, particularly where they meet the ocean, the estuaries. Estuaries are, are probably the most polluted environments that we that we have. So there you go, there's a nice compromise answer for you. Um, estuaries are probably the, <laughs> probably the hardest hit and they're right in between. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this one's from Craig. We are talking about increasing the uptake of electric vehicles at the same time as the government is looking at investing large sums of money into infrastructure. What are some investment into, what about investment into EV charging stations? Or do I need to write a business case to get it through the infrastructure policy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you do write a business case, Craig. Um, no, I think, I mean, there is actually quite a lot underway on this. I think this is a, this is actually something that the the government has been acting on, and and there are um, there is a, a network of electric vehicle um, recharging stations that are that are on the way. Uh, at least that's my that's my understanding. So I think we will see that stuff um, popping up over the next over the next few years, um, but. I mean, I, I do think the, um, you know, the the investment that is required in terms of infrastructure is probably more around our public and active transport networks and and around our um, our water infrastructure, so that we can build that medium density housing around our public and active transport networks. That's way more important i think than than evs i mean e evs are going to be important for new zealand's always going to be a sparsely populated country and people will need to drive between towns i think that's where evs are important but we shouldn't need cars to live in our cities and that you know that's that whole 15 minute city idea that people can live within 15 minutes of where they work and play by foot by bicycle or by public transport and that is going to require a massive re-engineering of our cities. But that is probably the most cost-effective investment that we can reduce to, which will not only reduce the cost of housing and the cost of transport, but get our carbon emissions down at the same time. That's the part of the housing crisis that's lesser spoken about. And, you know, what we see at the moment is, especially Auckland's, classic example of what's going on so houses become more and more expensive so people are being pushed especially our poorest are being pushed further and further away from where they work which means means each and every day they're having to travel further to commute to get to their place of work from their home that's terrible for emissions it and is. that's a part of the housing crisis that an overlap with the climate crisis that people aren't even speaking about absolutely i totally agree with you there I mean, the most shocking aspect of the housing crisis to me is Pocono. I mean, <laughs> um, I can't believe that people commute from Pocono 
to to Auckland. I mean, that that place used to be a yeah. a, a, a tin pot town with a with a with, with some bake with a bacon store and a and a couple of ice cream shops, and now it's it's commuter belt for Auckland. I mean, I I find that mind That's blowing. Thing, yeah. I mean, I know I know someone who was doing it as well. Um, it's what people are having to do if they want to be able to afford to buy somewhere that at least they can stay working where they've been working and at least not be so disconnected from their friends and their family and their community and their village. Yeah. You know, it's, I could go yeah. on about that for a long time. Yeah, I'll move on to the next question. Great. Um, so this one is from Jack. Why do you think our major, in quotes, which rate that, parties aren't actually really doing anything to fix this. Oh, like same reason why they Let's don't. Let's assume he's referring to Labour and National. Yeah, yeah. They are different when it comes to the story. Like, yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, um, although, you know, I did have some hope when Todd Muller was leader of the National Party. I mean, he really does. Um, he really does see climate change as as an issue. So there, there is a big chunk of of national that that is concerned about environmental issues, um, and and I do I I do hold there is, hope. You have to say that voice is gone, Jeff. Sorry. You're right, and they do have a big contingent of that blue green, but right now the rhetoric that's coming out of the leadership is yes. not at all even yeah. pretending to care about climate change. No, they've gone. They've gone back to the old school um, national that we know from from you know the last administration. Um, but you know that's that's kind of their um, th that's their well known playbook. But a lot of the younger MPs involved with national do really care about the environment, and I I do hold hope that that they will get their act together on this. And I think actually having a an environmentally friendly party that is willing to work with them will encourage them to do that. Because at the moment, uh, there's just nothing in in it for National to to have any interest in the environment. Sadly, and that's a shame because there are quite a, a number of people on on the right who do care about the environment, um, and that's why it's so important to have top in Parliament to to encourage them to to, to do that. Um, I think so, this is a good question though from Jack, like why hasn't yeah. Labour, especially when you've got the Greens right next to you and they are not allowed to use New Zealand First as an excuse, it's unacceptable to just scapegoat their way out of inaction. Yeah, yeah. Why? I mean, because this is, uh, you know, like any long-term issue, just like housing, um, you know, the, it, it, it doesn't bring short-term votes. We all know that. We all know that Labour and National are in that competition over the the middle voter, which means they're never going to rock the boat. And anything, any sort of long term change requires, um, you know, some some quite radical changes. I just, uh, you know, it, it's it's too risky for Labour to do that. They're always going to to take the the, the safe approach, the middle ground. I think what this has shown me, and I'll kind of sidestep the question for a second, because, you know, what I think I'm seeing being this involved in politics this time is just how much branding, political branding, sways people's mindset around issues. Mm -hmm. And even though we've seen that even with Greens in power, we have not made progress other than getting a plan to get a plan, which yes, you're right, Jeff, I agree, that's an excellent starting point, but it is just that, a plan to make a plan. And so, but because they have this um, excellent branding, people think that that's the way to go. And we're seeing repeatedly policies coming out of there that's not listening to the experts. And they're the ones saying, just listen to the science, just listen to the science, but they're not. Mm. And it's just incredibly frustrating. Yeah, yeah, and you know when you only inspiring. got <laughs> when you only got um, thirty seconds to to debate something in in the media, it doesn't really uh, allow you to get to get that that nuance across. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, you're 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 right, Shai. Most of our politics now is 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 boiling down to to branding, and that's why it's so fascinating to watch Labour and National battle it out over uh, Nationals' um, poor, you know, budgeting, uh, you know, in in recent times because this that you know that's really hitting national where it hurts in terms of their their brand as being you know strong and stable good managers of the economy yeah it's um it's pretty rich right you know your finance spokesperson's a historian and yet if that had been the case for labor they would crucify them over something like that but it's like something you know whatever whatever's good enough for for them just doesn't apply to anyone else for some reason yeah yeah <laughs> anyway sorry i know i know we're digressing um there's a question here i know we've got to go soon jeff but there's um a good question here from jimmy can farmers offset carbon by investing into state-owned forests and if not why not oh i mean if we uh, if, if we have our way absolutely i mean um the whole so the so the the whole proposal is for uh, agriculture to be able to use trees to offset their emissions and so what we're talking about is having a separate emissions trading scheme for land-based businesses so that would include forestry and farmers and that's really important because it puts them all on a level playing field and when you're talking about land use it's important that they're on a level playing field because at the moment with forestry in the emissions trading scheme and and the rest of farming out, it makes all sorts of really weird um, distortions. So yes, that would be the plan. Um, but I think what uh, what we'd probably see most likely most farmers do is offset on their own farms. So you'd see farmers putting their riverbanks and their erosion prone land into native bush. You'd see them take you know, maybe uh, an, an underused south facing slope and pop a couple of hectares of pine up. And that I think is how most farms would be able to then say, I'm carbon neutral. And I think that's a good thing, right? If we can, if we can um, have farms that are environmentally certified, if they can say, we're compliant with fresh water and we're, uh, you know, and we're carbon neutral. That's a real selling point to the world, I think, going forward. So I think the kind of system that we're talking about will allow farms to, to, to be, uh, to, to earn an environmentally friendly tick or whatever you might call it, you know, it could be a gold, silver and bronze type system or whatever. Uh, but I think ultimately that's where we're headed. And we need to move away from this idea of, you know, some people want to make farmers the enemy and some might want to make farmers heroes and however you use them, they shouldn't be used as a political football. The fact of the matter is, is that they are always going to form a crucial part of New Zealand, New Zealand's economy. And it's about real progress is making them operate in a way that is sustainable for them and their business and for our environment and moving us all forward so we are all sustainable into the future yes. and so national labor can fight about it and national can try and you know make it like they're the heroes for farmers and try and make labor the bad guys for farmers but that's all just completely irrelevant at the end of the day we need to be supporting them so that behaviors are changing that's right and they're a lot of farmers <laughs> Exactly. And, and a lot of farmers I talk to, I mean, yes, they say, look, the sort of stuff that Labour and Greens are throwing at us is complex and bureaucratic and a real pain in the butt. But they're also saying, well, Lash National's not helping either because we, we know that we are going to have to act on the stuff. We know that we're going to have to act on climate. We know that we're going to have to sort out our fr the fresh water issues. So actually, National's approach of just chucking the regulations away doesn't serve farmers either. And the more progressive farmers know that. Uh, and that's why they that, that's why they like Top's approach, which we're going to be talking about much more next week. Uh, so let's not um, get into that too in much. Space. Yes. Spoiler alert. Don't spoiler alert, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I'm just think, is that the last question there, Adam, in the in the chat that you just put there? Um, so there's a question. Oh, there's one more coming. Okay, cool. So, um. This one is coming from a user on YouTube. Is that the one, Kane? Oh, username has helped me think of username. Okay, cool. This is the last question. Okay, so what must be done to protect future Kiwis against the consequences of climate change due to inaction thus far? It can and must be reduced, but it can't be prevented altogether. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really... It's a really powerful uh, comment, and uh, there's, you know, there, there's a there's an awful lot that we need to do in that space. Um, credit to James Shaw, actually, in this area, I think probably the biggest win that the Greens have had under this uh, government happened in the last week with the with the financial stuff that you probably I don't know if you even saw it, Shy, um, but the financial disclosure stuff. Uh, around climate risk, and, and that really is a big deal. So I, I do uh, take my head off to the Greens for, for achieving that. Um, and that's going to open up quite a big conversation about, uh, about this, the kind of risks that people face from climate change, um, both in terms of infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure and businesses that are threatened from sea level rise and more extreme weather events and all that sort of stuff. But also on the mitigation side, the, the, the companies that, that are, you know, at risk if they can't use fossil fuels, for example, anymore. So that this, this sort of regulation is a, is a good start, but then once we actually recognize these risks, we have to come up with a plan for what we're gonna do with them. And local government, again, this is where our conversation about getting funding right for local government is so important because local government has so much of the infrastructure that's threatened by climate change. And at the moment, they have no hope in hell. They have no revenue to even start to prepare for this sort of stuff. So um, we we really need, you know, part of resolving this local government funding issue is help is giving them the space to be able to start to prepare for the climate change issues that are that are coming down the pipeline. Um, but there's some pretty big conversations that communities are going to have. You know, for example, in my uh, electorate of Rongatai, we, you know, that south coast gets battered by storm after storm. And um, parts of that south coast are, are really, you know, are, are, are struggling, frankly. And the, the council has invested in building up that, that defence. But there will be a time when defending the land actually starts actually means that we will no longer have a beach so there's some quite big conversations to have down on the south coast that we should start having now because 10 20 30 years down the line when sometime this this next big storm hits and destroys a seawall we need to be saying well actually do we rebuild this which means we're not going to have a beach anymore or do we start a managed retreat? In which case, where do those houses go? Where do we put the infrastructure? All that sort of stuff. If we start having those conversations now and we, and we start ensuring that local government has the funding now to deal with that stuff, it's, it's really gonna help. Like all these conversations, Jeff, I just get so like torn between all this hope because of these, excellent policies that are coming out of um, the work that you and the policy committee are doing and this frustration of complete either inaction, faux action, or just straight out head in the sand reactions to the situation. And despite the fact that most Kiwis by now know that this is a crisis, know that real change is needed, know that we have to do something about this, and not just talk about it. And yet we just don't have the political will or courage or 
skills to listen to the science and the experts that we that we need that the public expect and the public deserve and so i i'm so proud of this policy the work you guys have done is excellent and i would love any party to steal this from us because it is so critically important Cup Thank you, show. Jess. no problem <laughs> have a great friday night people i'm gonna go have dinner thanks what for joining to? us yeah i need to go have dinner as well <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. October 17th is the day you get to decide what you want for Aotearoa New Zealand. 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years in the future. TOP has a plan to tackle the biggest issues in our society. We're a team of experts, not politicians. We're scientists, economists, lawyers, small business owners. We bring in a universal basic income. $250 a week for every adult Kiwi, no questions asked. This gets rid of the welfare trap and allows people to retrain, start new businesses and rewards unpaid labour like household work and volunteering. TOPS housing and tax reforms would hold house prices and rent stable for a generation. New Zealand needs property owners to pay their fair share of tax. We need more quality medium density housing around active and public transport networks. We also need stronger renters' rights so everyone can call their house a home. Small businesses are the backbone of New Zealand's economy. To help them thrive, TOP will abolish provisional tax. We'll help businesses with digital uptake and energy efficiency and give them access to universities and polytechnics to solve their problems. You know, the COVID recovery, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to build back better than we were before. We can improve the environment and have a thriving economy. This is what real progress looks like, and businesses can be part of the solution. Aotearoa New Zealand is a taonga. It's a treasure. Decades of old school thinking has given us the problems we face today. Let's make a change. The Opportunities Party has the skills, ideas, and courage to make real change. Don't leave change to chance. Party vote top.